go. All right, everybody, we are live for another developer interview here on Game Wisdom. Welcome to our latest episode of the Perceptive Podcast, where we examine the R and science of games. I am, of course, Josh Beiser, and we have another great interview lined up this week. My guests are the developers of one of the more famous uh, PC games to be released, Star Control and Star Control 2. They are formerly from Toys for Bob, and they are now uh, forming a Frungy Games to develop the Urquan Masters 2. And they're here to talk about that as well as kind of the legacy of the franchise. So please welcome Fred Ford and Paul Ritchie. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Thanks. Nice to be here. Yeah. Good to be here. It is great to talk to you guys again. For those of you watching us, uh, we did an interview, like, I was, like, talking to you guys like, about saying something for, like, five or six years. We finally did an interview about two years ago, and I think we, we went from five to two, so we're getting better in terms of setting up these dates. <laughs> you have a better record than our doing sequels. I think we're on closing in on 30 years here. <laughs> nice. Let me make sure I got the name. Uh, I had to switch the names around. There we go. Don't want people to confuse. Not only do you have Paul Ritchie and Fred Ford, but in the background, if he waves his hand, you will get the mysterious Ken Ford. Oh, can we see him? Ken, you're going to have to stand up. You're just <laughs> going to have to. Ken oh, I see. Um, has worked with us for many years and uh, actually worked on the 3DO version of Star Control. Mm hmm. And that was the one that I originally played way back when. Star Control 2 on the 3DO was the first time. So we have two and a hand for our guests <laughs> this <hand>. week. <laughs> but it is a... And Ken is also part of Frenzy Games. So Frenzy Games has four full-time employees. We're, we're down from the 150 or so at Toys for Bob. But what we're doing is working with people who we either had a really great time with at you know previous places like Toys for Bob, mm -hmm. or Ken, who in fact worked with us on most of the games we've done. Fantastic. So, uh, we certainly have a lot we are going to be talking about tonight. And for the audience watching us live, if you have any questions for Paul, Fred, or Ken, uh, let us know in the comments and I will bring them up as they come in. But, Ken plays a lot of Thief 1 and 2, so any Thief related questions oh, should go to him. I know Oscar in chat is a huge uh, Thief fan. I am terrible at Thief. I am not the stealth guy. I am the run around shooting guy, <laughs> making loud noises. But we certainly have a lot to get into tonight. So, uh, for people who may have missed our original cast or have not heard of Star Control, can you guys kind of give like a brief overview of you know who you are, you know what is the game for those of you for those of them listening? Sure. Um, not surprisingly, I'm the guy who talks more uh, of the partnership. <laughs> but Fred and I have been working together for 30 years at this point. Um, and together, we uh, founded Toys for Bob back in 1989, 1990. And there we created uh, Star Control 1 and 2 uh, as uh, developers uh, under contract with Accolade. And then after that, we moved to Crystal Dynamics, where we worked on 3DO uh, for them, both as contractors and eventually as employees. Uh, Toys for Bob was an internal division there, and we did Pandemonium and The Horde mm -hmm. and Star Control and a crazy game only released in Japan called Little Witching Mischiefs. And eventually, we started doing um, kids' games. We, we really enjoyed doing kids' games for a while. Then uh, we spun Toys for Bob out to our own separate company, uh, worked with Activision on some games for them, uh, ultimately be, was acquired by Activision, and uh, Toys for Bob is still a, a studio of Activision. And we ran it for quite a long time developing Skylanders, inventing and developing the Skylanders series. And then a little over a year ago, Fred and I um, sort of detached and had handed over the leadership of the studio to two very smart people. And since then, uh, Fred's been working hard on programming, and besides drinking Mai Tais, I've been doing some thinking and talking mm -hmm. about the sequel to the Urquan Masters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in case you didn't realize, he's the design half, I'm the engineering half. Yeah. All right. Ben's the hand half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, 
I, sorry, but so after leaving Toys for Bob, um, Fred and I debated what we wanted to do next, and we really felt that we'd been promising people to make a sequel to Star Control 2 for, uh, for a good long time. And so that's what we set out to do as part of Frenzy Games. And kind of our mission is make a game that the fans will love, make it in a manner in which we want to without any sort of, you know, overlords involved. <laughs> and um, what was the third thing? There's always a third thing. Yeah, there's a third thing. We'll get back around to the third thing. It may have involved making a living at it, but we'll see. <laughs> All right. And I always forget that you guys worked on The Horde, because that was another game that I played for 3DO. And I do remember mm -hmm. Pandemonium. I think I only played for like a few minutes. That was the original PlayStation, but I'm sure there are fans yeah. of that one around. Yeah, it's worth more than a few minutes. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that was our first 3D game. Nice. And... I know with Toys for Bob, again, like with the Skylanders franchise, like I've been uh, bugging you guys about doing a talk about Toys of Life at some point. I don't know if we'll get to that tonight, but, you know, if we can survive this cast together, that will have to be our next topic because it is such a fascinating one. And uh, Paul has already uh, noticed all my amiibos back there. And I, I tell people, like, I'm glad the Skylanders didn't happen when I was, like, still a teen, because you guys probably would bankrupt me in my household <laughs> with all those toys. Time. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a lot of Skylanders in my garage, and <laughs> I'm looking to sell them, so. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, there's certainly a lot to talk about with Star Control, especially with the Urquan Masters, too. So one thing that I'm sure for any hardcore fans watching this live record probably have heard about was, of course, the uh, little bit of the uh, legal uh, issue that happened between you guys and Stardock. And that kind of took over conversations for, I think it was about like two years, I think, give or take. And I know some questions will most likely come up if people are watching this so anything you guys want to, like talk about in terms of you know how that ended up or you know where you know what is like the state of things right now between the two well, i'm gonna let you say that one well um i'll go back in history to why there was even the possibility of a dispute which mm -hmm. is uh back in the day when we were making these games the the publisher would typically um, because we were outside contractors with Accolade for Star Control 2. So the publisher would retain the uh, trademark and we would have the copyrights. And so it was kind of like a split, a splitting of rights. And over the years, as Accolade went out of business and or got sold and I guess Atari went out of business and there was a, a sale of the trademark, it, it passed through different hands. And so there was just kind of a misunderstanding about what rights belonged where. And after spending some money with hanging out with lawyers, which I don't actually encourage, I've got nothing against lawyers, but, but uh, what we decided to do was sort of bypass them and go have a conversation directly with the head of Stardock. And it was actually just having a kind of, quote unquote, face to face over the phone conversation that let us sort it out and we concocted a i think a very innovative and interesting way of what the settlement terms were and we discovered that we both sort of had this strange connection with honey um i like to drink alcohol and make it uh in that order um but um so i like to make mead which is an alcoholic beverage you brew from honey and it's a very <laughs> old traditional recipe and brad likes to raise bees and make honey and I had been thinking about um, raising bees uh, as an experiment. I've, I've been trying to learn all medieval villager D&D <laughs> skills over the course of my life. And um, raising bees seems like a good one to learn how to do, you know, whether, whether you just are trying to learn about the ancients or like survive the zombie apocalypse with a lot of honey. Uh, so anyway, we, we sort of ended up talking a lot about that and, and kind of realizing that it was way more fun to make games and to talk about games and to play games than it is to fight about them. So that got settled. And that sort of very creative settlement, uh, that actually did appear in the, the text of the written settlement agreement. And I've actually used this as an example in a creative problem-solving lecture I give sometimes to, um, to graduate students. And they always believe, I think I'm making up a story when I tell them, we solved this with honey, and it's in the dispute agreement. 
Yeah. Uh, there you go, everyone. If you if there are any legal issues, see if there's a honey as a uh, possible solution. Yeah. Which now that I think about, it, sounds like the puzzle like solution to like one like the old school like nineties adventure games. How do you solve a lawsuit? <laughs> Use honey. Yeah. When will I ever need this honey? Never. <laughs> Use honey on Cobra. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but that, of course, did uh, put a delay on the Orquan Masters too. And for people like watching us right now, like, what is kind of like the current state of things? Like, how are things like coming along with it? Um. Well. We have we have some ideas about what we're going to be making, and uh, we actually have some tech that I've made uh, that will assist us in doing that. And we're actually testing out um, a rough melee uh, at this point, <laughs> and um, we don't have it all figured out. But that's kind of part of the journey that that we want to set for ourselves. So the original Star Control. Um was this sort of action strategy game. Star Control 2 took it and turned it into an action adventure game. And the experience was really organic, and it was with a very small crew, initially just me and Fred. And, and then we had people helping us, friends, and, and a few um, people we brought in on contract. And it was, like I said, very organic. We would build part of it and see what we liked, and then build some more, and then throw stuff out if we didn't like it. And so development went on for a while. And we decided that we really enjoyed that process, not throwing stuff away. But we, we enjoyed the process of doing it organically with a small group. And so that's what we decided to pursue. But, but so we couldn't, we chose not to use the source code that we started with because it was in C and it was for, you know, PC graphics cards from the ancient past. And we had learned over the 30 years some, some things to do in development that make things better and faster and more inclusive. And one of the things that Fred has developed has always been this sort of um, development system for non-programmers that allows people with high school mathematics and a somewhat logical mind to make gameplay. And there's no like making compiler errors. There's none of that crazy curly braces stuff that can get in the way of fun sometimes. And so, uh, for example, Skylanders was built all of the interactivity in all of the games, well, the first three games we did, Giants, the original Skylanders, and Trap Team, was built entirely in this engine. And all of the, all of the things that you see in those Skylanders games are made by designers, not programmers, except mm -hmm. for the very cool tools that the programmers did make. So we wanted to kind of go, in particular, Fred, um, after leaving you know, uh, our jobs at Toys for Bob as studio heads, he had some ideas about the next generation of that kind of thinking. How do you empower uh, non-programmers, but, you know, professional game people to make uh, in the modern game context, which obviously it's more powerful machines, but obviously they're also over the internet. And so that's largely what Fred's been developing. And at the same time, I've been working myself and with some volunteers from the fan community mm -hmm. on assembling kind of uh, stories and designs for ships and you know anything that we can pull together. Because another thing that we want to do in this process is actually work with the fan community and have them be part of the experience. And that doesn't mean design by, you know, votes. That's, you know, it's, we, we get that you kind of can't make cool creative decisions and just do it sort of by consensus all the time so we're, we're definitely leading things but we're really looking to the fans to tell us what matters to them and you know we asked last week e each week we ask three questions on our reddit thread uh, slash r uqm2 and then we'll get hundreds of responses to them and some of them are funny and some of them are brilliant and some of them are out there but uh it's really been super motivating and then straight up, there's some brilliant ideas that we get like, wow, that's cool. Got to somehow figure out how to fit that in there. So that's been occupying our, my time and Dan Gerstein. He's our fourth team member, uh, sort of working with the Reddit community. And then also he's been doing all of the scripting to bring up Melee within our new engine. So we have the C source code from, you know, the, the 90s. And then we have the new dev system. And then, so Dan and, and to a limited extent, I have been recreating the functionality of Super Melee 
as tightly and as accurately as we can. And then once we know that we can achieve that, then we can start, you know, moving out and implementing new ships and bringing in the other components of the game of the full adventure game. Hmm. And I, that's very interesting about developing tools that are more for developers as opposed to people with who need like a very strong programming background. And like that is something yeah, that I've well, thought about. Go ahead. That means that you can broaden the pool of contributors. Um, mm -hmm. And there are a lot of, uh, especially, you know, especially young youngins these days uh, have a lot of passion, but not a lot of um, uh, training. And um, you can give them this and they can they can make things that while they might not be final in, in that sort of sense, they can at least show you they made something fun. And then 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 you can we can make the decision. Should we bring this to final? So allowing them, and also cutting out the programmer allows them to, to go off in a corner and make a thousand stupid things. But <laughs> when they, they make the one great thing, they can show that to us. And we don't know about the other 999 <laughs> things that they made. At least, yeah. In, in professional development, programmers are often the scary adults in the room. And so <laughs> going to them with what seems like a crazy-ass idea it that that's a risk you know it's it's scary to do that so if you can take the programmers um filter filter out of the broadcast of ideas so like literally you can make a gazillion we, we did this actually with skylanders where we said okay we know what we want to do how does combat work everybody you've got two weeks go off and make up as many crazy ways we could resolve combat as possible and so we came back and one person had created this sort of like tennis game experience and <laughs> someone else had a top down view, which is sort of where we ended up going with someone else had a point of view, a, you know, first person point of view. And, um, and then also when we were working on trap team and we, we had this vision of like, we want to pull characters out of the game and stick them in a physical toy. And we were working with projectors and holograms <laughs> and all these things that were totally unreasonable to do in a, you know, $8 toy. And then it was our, our, our sound department that had learned to use the game development engine, and they mocked up this thing using a Wiimote. So they could actually show how, if you had a little voice speaking out of a little crappy speaker, pardon my language, it sounded like someone was trapped inside something. So <laughs> yeah, we're, we're big believers in uh, building tools and situations to empower a large group of people to create what they feel and see in their head. And then once it's out there, it's much easier to talk about. Reading docs, listening to people yak, that's, that's not as fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I find very fascinating about that, because when we look at kind of like how much like indie development has changed over like the last like 11, 12 years with kind of the greater appropriation of like Unity, Unreal, Game Maker, like on that side, it's been like a very big treasure trove for programmers. And... I mean, for people who who watch this channel or watch me, like they know we have seen some amazing games come from like five to ten person teams, or even fewer than that. And a lot of that's just been like getting those engines out there. But in terms of like like as Fred said about like you know letting like somebody who's a designer you know get in, like avoiding like the programming side, that's still relatively you know weird or it's not it's not really like talked about and like one of my first like game ideas it was like 20 years ago i wrote up a design document for was just literally i like, called like the platformer construction kit it was supposed to be just like a tool set to create 2d and 3d platformers you know take the programmer out of the equation on that and then of course we saw over the last decade like super mario maker and like i just think about like how much like of a gold mine Nintendo is sitting on with that one franchise with, you know, you can really put that in front of kids. I have a, uh, I give a library talk where I talk about using that to teach level design. I mean, you give that to someone, they don't need to know anything about programming. They just need to know, you know, Mario goes right, avoid a Goomba and start making levels. And like, it is like scary just like how creative like people have gotten just using that one tool set who have probably never touched, you know, one line of code in their lives. Yeah, we can also make modding tools with it very easily. So it's cuz it could they could literally make levels or design ships or 
the hard part is the artwork and this and the the sound assets and things like that that is not really what my tool is designed for. Mm-hmm. It's designed for gameplay, not so much the the fluff on top of it. One of the early on, there were a lot of construction sets, you know. So um, I made before working with Fred. Um, I made games under contract with uh, Electronic Arts, and everything was a construction set back then. And the, one of the problems was we as as game developers, even really junior young game developers understood the basics of what we wanted to do. So we would make a construction set and then we could use it. But in the mass of people in the world, gamers, computer gamers were a tiny, tiny fraction. Nowadays, everybody is a gamer, um, whether we play on our phone or on our computer or on our consoles or d and D's got up, you know, lots of people playing D&D again. And the consequence of that is that the number of people who can meaningfully engage with the creative side of construction sets is far larger. You don't have to educate them on the basics of how a game is made. They've played them their whole lives. So that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about things like, you know, the Game Maker uh, and, um, you know, the, the very first one, I, there was an arcade game construction set. I think it was from Broderbund that I did some contracting work making a pirate adventure and a the bloodiest kung fu game I could make with this other guy, Greg Johnson, with sprites, you know, that the pixels are as big as your pinky nail. But <laughs> um, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, I think just also watching the way people use Minecraft, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, definitely Minecraft, Roblox. Like, that's like, like I think, like the new generation of these of this kind of stuff. And just being able to give somebody a tool set that you know, let them go crazy with it. And I'm going to really date myself with this one. I remember with Click and Play back in the 90s. I think I saw, like, that enormous manual somewhere around here about, you know, teach everything about game design and making a game with it. Yeah. And I do think, like, as somebody who, like, talks about game design so often, I do think that it does feel like there's going to be that trend of having more tools for non-programmers to be able to get into these games. Like, I'm still surprised that more developers haven't really jumped on the whole Mario Maker train. Like, I know, like, an indie team put out uh, Mega Man Maker. Like, that is not exactly official, but there are people using that to make Mega Man uh, mods and, you know, Kaizo games and just, like, crazy, you know, mixes of that. And I feel like there's definitely a market for that, even if it's just for like an educational point of view about, you know, having something you can put into an entry level where you just like game design class and say, you know, use this and let me see what your game ideas are. Because like you guys said, it's far easier to show this stuff than it is to just talk about like I could as anyone who watches me knows, I could ramble on about game design ideas for like five to ten hours, like it's nothing, but ultimately that's not really showing you what that game design is. I was gonna say fun is really hard to predict. Mm-hmm. It's much easier if you have something that is fun to show people. Um because if it were easy to predict, then everybody would making be making awesome games. It's, I think it's like cooking, where, you know, you can talk about cooking and you can trade recipes, but until you actually have something to eat or taste, you don't really know if it's good yet. And then when you do, you immediately think, oh, this needs more of this or more of that. Or like, oh, my God, this was a horrible idea. You know, cinnamon and tuna do not go well together. This is a true story. I did this with my kids. It did not go well. But um, so having, I mean, the way we made Star Control in the beginning and, and most of our games is we don't think it all the way through. Um, we don't have a big dock and then we just walk away and let people put it in. We build the, the what we think the heart of the experience is. So with Star Control, it was literally two ships. Initially, they were blasting away at asteroids and then we got rid of the asteroids and were blasting away at each other. And then we added some more ships and it just sort of built on itself. And we just had the time and, and that luxury of not having such an expensive production that like we had to get it done because it was costing us a billion dollars a week. Um, so you could really have fun in the process. Whereas, you know, we, we walked into situations where like, here's the design of the game. Here's, you know, sketches of all the levels, just make it. And, you know, there's fun in like craft, 
you know, and doing your job, but it's not as like just thrilling and rewarding as like, you know, what would be fun is if I could light you on fire <laughs> you know, that would be awesome. <laughs> and then doing it. But also if you, if you design everything out up front, if, if you made a miscalculation about what was going to be fun and it's not fun, then, then you have to choose between, I, but I have this massive design that uh, that bases itself on this being fun. So do I have to throw that all out now? Or can we somehow make it fun enough to still follow the massive design that follows? And that's not a great, that's never worked for us. And risk management and development has really created um, part of the, the creation of genres. So when we started making games, there weren't genres. Um, there were Pac-Man games, or there were, you know, this clones or that clones. But every game was such a, like, we don't know. Let's try making a, you know, a game where you're like, I'm trying to remember, um, you know, The Legend of Heracles by Stuart Smith back in the early 80s. I, I hadn't seen a game like that. Um, maybe Alibaba, which was the one he did before. But it was this, you know, an adventure game with a historical setting and a little bit of dialogue and a lot of combat and you died a lot. And... And then the next game you would see would be something totally different, you know. Um, and then as things got more expensive and people got more careful and the stakes got higher, they started saying, well, look, what we know works is, you know, a game like, you know, um, you know, Ball Blazer or something like that. You know, let's, let's take that and let's add this other thing to it or let's port it to a different machine. And now, you know, obviously the amount of money that can be made in the field is concentrated into an absolutely tiny number of games. You know, the, the vast majority of money is in three or four games that are made. So super high stakes, billions of dollars. And so it really does need to be well thought out. Um, and, you know, because they're, they stand to lose a billion dollars if they mess up. So, you know, they don't want to mess up. Um, and that's part of why we have, stepped back and said, let's make games the way we want to. Um, and it's an experiment, you know, it's 30 years later, it's a whole different world. But our, our belief is that if we go into it with the same kind of feeling in our hearts and the same kind of restricted resources and the same kind of access to other creative people that we had, that hopefully we can find some of that same magic. And if we find the fun, yeah, or the magic, we can decide then to spend more resources on it to make it even better. But we've already found something that that works. Mm -hmm. Yep, and like it's something that we've said a lot when we have our design talks here about just how much the core gameplay loop of your title it's pretty much paramount. If that isn't working right, nothing else you're going to attach to it is going to make that better. And it's a lesson I think a lot of developers. Like, I've seen any developers who, like, very early on in their careers get that right, and then I've seen some that have struggled with that. And it is, like, as I'm sure you both of you are well aware, I'm sure as any developers watching this live recorded, it's very hard to know, you know, is this idea worth pursuing? Because, I've again, I've seen games where, like, within, like, five minutes of playing, I can tell very quickly yes, this is good, or no, I, I'm just not enjoying this. And you won't be hearing somebody saying, no, I don't enjoy this if you just spend the last three years of your life, you know, working eight to ten hour days on this game. We've all, we've all been there. Mm -hmm. Game design is, is not a game of addition. The, the equation for a good game has not got a lot of plus signs. It's got a lot of multiplication signs. Mm -hmm. And so it all, if you do a half-assed job at a whole lot, you have a really awful game. If you do a really great job with a core mechanic, um, then you can multiply it with some other things, you know. And if you get great graphics, and if you get a really awesome sound and music person, and if you test it well and debug it. But if you have like loose, not fun combat in a game that's built around combat resolution, you're going to be fighting it the whole time, and people aren't going to have faith. And one of the things when you bring people together to work on a creative project is you have to have a collective faith in it being great to kind of, because it's not there when you start, you're actually making it. So everybody has to have something in their head, a vision of like, this is going to be great and I'm going to make my part of it. So if you can prove it by saying, look, you know, I told you two guys hitting each other with sticks was going to be fun and here it is. And you're like hitting each other with sticks and like, this is awesome. 
then you know you can start building stuff on it, build a story, maybe replace the sticks with swords, I don't know. But um, for us anyway, getting that two-player head-to-head, um, just like I want to fight at lunch, and you know we're going to play every lunch, and if I lose, I'm going to be sad for the rest of the afternoon. That's I know I've done my job right when that happens. Mm-hmm. Yep, and I, I like what you said there about it is a, a game of multiplication, not addition, or like that kind of equation. Because again, there are a lot of developers out there who have said, "Oh, I'm just going to make so and so, but I'm going to add this, 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 and this to it," and oftentimes they end up with a lesser product. And it's something that I've said to a lot of people that. It's important to play quote unquote bad games or games that didn't become multi million dollar successes because that's where you see those landmines, those issues that stop somebody from enjoying a game, and that's how you learn it. And if all you do is, if you're a platformer fan, if all the only games you play are Mario, yeah, you're going to know what Mario is, but you're not going to know all the iteration and all the work that goes into making Mario jump. Like, that was the subject of my second design book. I said that getting a character to jump up in the air, that's relatively simple. Getting that to feel right in somebody's hands and make them want to do it, you know, five to 10,000 times over the course of playing a game, that's another story. This con- had this exact conversation with Dan Gerstein the other day where Dan hasn't played Melee thousands of hours like I have. So for me, like, I know the way the Star Control ships work in my fingers and in my soul. And so I was really saying, we got to work on this. And I said, I don't know if you ever played this game, Castle of Illusions. It was the first Mickey Mouse game. And its jump was perfect. Its jump was amazing. And then a sequel came out. And I pressed the jump button. I was just like, oh, no, they wrecked it. They <laughs> <laughs> got the jump wrong. And admittedly, maybe I cared more about that than I should have. But I remember playing the rest of the game. And it was just like, every time I jumped, it didn't feel good. And man, I just was so disappointed. And that's one of the lessons I learned, which is when you've got something good, don't let go. You know, don't just throw it away. <laughs> Make sure you, you build on that. And I think that's a really good segue to this next question I want to ask both of you about kind of what's going on with the Oracle Masters 2 or kind of your thoughts on that. Because as I'm sure both of you are aware of, Star Control 2 came out quite a long time ago. And one of the things that we've certainly have seen, especially the last 10 years, has been this kind of push and pull between, quote unquote, like modern retro design. You know, making a game like a NES platformer or like a 90s first person shooter. And while there are certainly fans of that, conversely, a lot of people didn't grow up playing those kinds of games. It's something that I see from a lot of the adventure game genre, that I think they've kind of struggled with this idea of bringing in new people. That on one hand, if you make it completely adherent to, you know, what happened in 1993, you're going to get fans of games from 1993. But, you know, there's a lot more people playing games these days. So it's that ever-challenging question of, how do I make something like a game from 20, 30 years ago but, you know, somebody who's never played that game can still enjoy it. And it is a very tough question, I think, for a lot of developers to answer. You know, it is. And I'm a huge Stardew Valley fan, which I never would have guessed. And it just happened. And <laughs> I feel like I joined a cult. But it's the sweetest <laughs> cult ever. But it, uh, it is very intentionally retro. It, it works with tropes and with mechanisms from those older games, but certainly in theme, it didn't attach itself to that. So it allowed itself to not feel quite so stilted. But um, the, the way that we look at it, and it's a, it is a very hard problem, you know, and it's part of what we talk with people about. One of our questions early on was, what? <laughs> how retro can you go? Right, how retro can you yeah. go? Um, some retro things are awful, you know. Uh, and if you look at how people manage, no one makes a really popular game by exactly matching the limitations of a Commodore 64 or you know an NES or something like that. Usually what they do is they capture the magic of that time, sometimes with the music or sometimes with the way characters move or a color palette, but they're always sort of cheating to, to give you more like what you imagine that game was like. If I went back and looked at Archon, you know, 
I, I'd be horrified by how primitive it was. But in my head, you know, and I even did a lot of the art and a lot of the design for that game, it's way better than it actually was. So I think what we try to do when we talk about making Star Control, uh, sorry, making the Urquan Masters, we don't, we don't have that trademark, so we don't ever call it that. The Urquan Masters 2 um, is find out what people's emotional experience was like. What was it like when they were playing and what was it like now that they're looking back on that experience? That's what we need to achieve and give them kind of a modern version of that or a, but we are making a limited choice, which is first and foremost, our goal is to appeal to and satisfy the need for the sequel in the people who played the original game. So while we want new people to play and we believe if we make a great game, that'll happen, we aren't starting from that point of like broadening the audience because the ways to do that are in direct contention, I think, with satisfying some of the hardcore audience. Like, for example, in the Urquan Masters, there's a lot of reading, like mm -hmm. a, a novel's worth of written material. You don't have to read it all, but that's a big part of the game. It's a big part of the humor and the drama. And I think, you know, to bring in a modern audience, do they really want to read? Probably not. But that's the core of the game and it's the heart of it and we don't want to goof that up. So there will be a ton of writing in this game. And there are thematic things that you can do to appeal to a wider audience. Um, and, you know, certainly things like, we were just debating, should we kill the player? Uh, we, this was a thing in the Reddit thread. Um, you know, should, how does save game work? How does hard failure work? And the Reddit thread, I think, represents the older and more hardcore set of fans of the Urquan Masters. But they were very clear that they loved that experience and the threat of death. There's definitely some things about the way the save game worked. They wanted to be modernized and to feel better and to like mm -hmm. prevent them from ever going, oh, why didn't I press the save button? You know, we, we can help with that. But they didn't want to round out that contour of experience because, you know, games, you know, you've played text adventures or, or the old adventure games. You're like, you round the corner and there's the Gorgon and you're dead. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess <laughs> the lesson I learned is don't go in that room ever. Uh, and we, we don't have to be that bad, but that experience is very hard to have now where death is just sort of a little time to take a breath, you know? Um, maybe you can make death like the Cylons a learning experience. But, uh, but anyway, so it is a big challenge to determine if you're making a game that is retro, what that means. We honestly step away from that and say, what did our original game deliver? How can we do that again in a way that feels fresh and new and is modern? So an example would be in the old days, we had PVP that was two people on one set of keyboards. We actually have told, had people tell us that they got repetitive stress injuries from playing Melee with their friends and their hands all mm. kept up. So obviously we're now going to support people playing across the internet. So that's something we definitely want to do because it takes the experience and empowers you to play against other people in, in a much higher percentage of the time than when it was just you and your friend playing after school on the keyboard. Mm -hmm. So that's a long way of saying, you're right, it's really hard to figure out when you're working with a retro, an old idea, how to make it modern or how mm -hmm. to make it popular nowadays. Yeah. And a comment came in from uh, Michael O'Malley, wanted to say, thanks for all your hard work, guys, in the chat there. <laughs> you're welcome. It's mostly him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, like that's that challenge, especially again with Star Control. And I'm, I'm happy you mentioned Stardew Valley because I got hooked on that one. I remember Harvest Moon from like 1996. That's what kind of started this like farming bug in the back of my head there. But it's that issue. And I, I hear the same things when I look at like the adventure game genre, that there are people like... When you think of adventure games, some people think, you know, a very creative, funny story. Some people think, you know, mind-melting puzzles where, you know, you have to do these crazy things. And if you don't, if you didn't pick up the uh, napkin in, like, the first five minutes of playing, your save file is going to be gone in 20 hours. And I think they really have had that hard time of kind of, like, squaring that circle of, I want to appeal to all those people who grew up playing, you know, Grim Fandango, Miss, and so on. 
But what about somebody who's never played those games, who's never heard of that design, and they just want to play a good game? And it is tough. Like you said, like, like there's some point where kind of like the rubber meets the road, that if you're not in for, you know, reading a lot of text or, you know, fighting spaceships, yeah, like, then, you know, Urquan Master Sue is not going to work for you. But how do you get somebody who's interested in that but doesn't want to play a game that feels like something out of 1993 or 1991. Well, I mean, in a way, if people played the game back then, then it's very hard to escape that they'll view this new game through that lens. And to a mm -hmm. certain extent, they'll see this game as part of that. And for those people, I hope that connection is okay. I think, I think in my mind, one of the reasons people like playing the Urquan Masters 2 was the story stuff wasn't rooted in 1992. Mm -hmm. It was pretty traditional science fiction mixed with absurdist sort of Monty Python-esque humor, mm -hmm. or maybe more like Brazil, sort of a dark, mm -hmm. absurdist view of things. Um, and then just a lot of recognizable tropes from science fiction that's sort of fun. It's like going to a science fiction convention and talking about your favorite books, except we did it through a game. And um, how do you bring new people in? That's a challenge because, you know, uh, having been part of kind of a studio that lasted a while, we saw entirely new people show up with new expectations about how games work, how people relate to each other, what work life mm -hmm. is like. And I think if you are excited about something and if you can, if you can go talk to somebody and get them excited about it, then maybe there's a chance that that person will like the game that that idea is, is communicating. But you're not going to please everybody for sure. And, you know, it's way better in my mind to have that like, you know what, it's okay that you don't want to play this because I know there's a ton of games and have fun. And rather than have someone go, boy, I hated your game. You made me play it and I don't like spaceships <laughs> and I don't like aliens and I don't agree. And you're just like, whoa. So I, I think... I mean, I, I am really excited about still science fiction and adventure and the idea of meeting other people and talking with them about life, which is essentially what you do with the aliens, except you take a particular attribute about humans and then you blow it way out of proportion and you give it a history and a culture and then you've got a fun <laughs> alien race to talk with. Um, so I'm just betting that, one, we get this game done before all of our fans age out, <laughs> age out of life. And... <laughs> But also, they and that there are more people, uh, and certainly people playing the Archon Masters. We, it was open source for you know 25, 30 years. Um, they there's a ton of young people who played it as well. They found something in it that they liked. So uh, I I believe in my heart that if we are true to the same uh, in, uh, inspiration, I think that for for the original game that this one will be fun and that certainly the people who like the first game will like it. And I believe that based on the writing and getting some younger writers involved with it as well, we might appeal, you know, to appeal out a bit. When we are, and at least for this, this go around the sequel, we have another motivation, which is we've, we've been studio heads for the last several years. And now we're finally getting a chance to, to make, make again. And we really, uh, one of the things about Star Control that was unique to us is it's kind of the, it's kind of the last game we got to make uh, uh, solely ourselves. I mean, sure, we were being paid, but nobody was telling us what to do. And so we're really enjoying being in that position again. And uh, if, if we all only make a game that we love, that might be good enough for this. <laughs> but uh we think will satisfy some other people too. Mm -hmm. And I just say uh, thank you for a comment. I got I, I misspelled your last name, Paul. I apologize. Oh, our little... Everybody misspells my his his last name. It's a hard word. <laughs> no e. Um, yeah, my last name is a mess. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you know it's a But But um, my my grandfather was a Danish immigrant right before World War II. So when World War II rolled around, it very rapidly became Richie. 
mm-hmm. said with a, no umlauts or anything like that. No, no strange sounds. And I went to Denmark, actually, because I had been told my whole life they're Danish. And I, they said, how do you pronounce your last name? And, and this is like my ancestral hometown where my grandfather was born and his great grandfather. And I said, but it's a Danish name. And they said, no, sir, this is a German name. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research. And yeah, we were Danish for two generations and then German before that. All right. So my daughter, who lives in England, she has given up on the Richie part. <laughs> no one in Europe will say it, Richie. <laughs> All right. And thank you for the uh, comment as well from that. We've got a fun little story out of that, too. <laughs> All right. But That's a risk around me. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, going back to what you were saying about kind of designing it for that specific market or for that specific fan base, I guess with that said, anything else you guys are thinking about in terms of, you know, UI, UX or approachability, like anything else in terms of like modernizing the experience that's like kind of like on your plates right now or what you've been thinking about? That would be a question for you, I guess. Well, um, let's see. I think one thing we're thinking about up front, uh, n- not everything is is decided, but is the involvement of people in the product creatively after we're after we have released it. So the allowing people to mod the game, that's something that we didn't do. People found ways to do it, but now we kind of have learned that there's smart, creative people out there who want to help us make great games. So why not why not welcome them in both during the development process and after? So. There's going to be that, which is that we're going to be um, allowing people to mod the game when we're done. There's um, playing cooperatively together, I think, is another thing we want to do. We want to, the, the adventure game, uh, the, the combat game, we've always had a player versus player combat, PvP, which is a ton of fun at lunchtime. And that certainly will have, you know, more features, more ships, and, and probably you'll be able to play more than two people. But... Uh, and Fred, stop me if you want. But um, I think one of the things that we realize is that people have fun playing together, uh, surprisingly. And so we're looking for ways for people to play what was a one-player adventure game collaboratively without it getting in the way of the experience. So how is it that I've got a save game and I'm playing and you can just join in, play with me for a while and leave um, and so we can continue our social experience within the context of the game, uh, but there's not all of the hard barriers of entry uh, that, that sometimes go along with those game experiences. So how can we empower friendship? It sounds sort of like Mr. Rogers stuff, but you know, friendship is awesome. I can go talk with someone in the middle of a field and have a great time. How is it that we can let them do that within the context of our game universe? Because then our game is going to seem awesome. (laughs) We have built-in gameplay by just having two people talking with each other. And then if... I was just going to say, another thing we're thinking of is uh, just the replayability aspect. Uh, You know, Star Star Control 2, Urquan Masters 1 was... uh, it, It really... I mean, there were way different ways to get to the end, but there was really only one end. Um, and so we're, we're mulling some ways to make replayability a little less predictable. I don't want to spoil anything about that yet, but. And it oftentimes, so, and again, I, I don't want to get into too many details quite yet, but, but we were talking about how do you make a classic save game user interface interesting? And we've come up with some really interesting ideas, not by saying let's evolve past that, but like, what are mechanics that you can build into a classic save game interface that haven't been done before? Um, and I'll leave that up to everybody out there to think about <laughs> that. But so I don't know if modernization is the right word, but certainly innovation is the right word. Um, you know, I think with Skylanders, in a way it was modern, but a lot of the gameplay was pretty um, well known and and Mm-hmm. straightforward though fun uh and so i don't necessarily think that there's a linear progression in time towards better game design i just sort of feel like like evolution 
there's a there's a <laughs> problem to be solved. There's an audience or a, a source of nutrients to be absorbed. What's the tool or the creature that's going to best get at that? So that's sort of how we observe in the circumstance that we've got with the audience we've got with the resources we have to make the game. What are the right decisions to make to be innovative, fun, understandable, uh, and have long lasting value to the people who play it? Mm. And that actually takes me to another question, but before we get to that, another one that came in from chat, uh, Michael asked, uh, regarding modability, do you mean tactical mods, or will you support changing slash editing plot beats? And then with the addition of multiplayer, will that affect the storytelling? So I kind of two questions there. Uh, the modability, I'm, I'm not going to promise anything, but uh, the tools are specifically designed to be outside of uh, any sort of compiled game. So uh, the data that they produce uh, or edit of the data that's already there can be incorporated directly into the game. Now, obviously, the uh, mo any mods vary in terms of quality, uh, the quality of the guy making the mod or girl, guy or girl making the mod. So if there's a, a, a rich mod ecosystem, I'm sure there'll be some great ones, and I'm sure there'll be some not so great ones. But, but if people are using our tools for part of it, then they'll have a common thing to share. Whereas sometimes if people are hacking their way into stuff, it works great for the people who understand how to do that, but it's hard to share more broadly. I mean, we, we would very much like to get an ecosystem of people collaborating to make, yeah, whether it's new experiences or to make the experience that we provided better. Um, and the, the other question was how will the multiplayer affect storytelling? That's, we don't want it to, generally speaking. Um, we don't want to limit single player because we just happen to make it multiplayer, because practically speaking, our original fans were all single play players, single game players, and um, we don't want to compromise their experience in order to have multiplayer. So the way we're looking at it is what we want to allow, and we're going to have this conversation on Reddit at some point, but we can introduce it now, which is we want to effectively have people enter into the game experience and be able to play it as though they had full control, like one player isn't relegated to a lesser role. Um, so one person could just head out into space and start collecting assets or fighting aliens or negotiating peace treaties, while another person can be just puttering around on a planet surface, you know, exploring alien life forms. Um, so why is that hard? Because of the way game states work. Like, in the past, we knew, if I change this game state, I know exactly where you are. You're in this conversation with this guy. Here's the circumstances that have happened before, and here's what we know haven't happened yet. Once players, like three or four players, are playing together, and you split up, and you start heading your own way, the game logic will have to be much more carefully crafted to avoid situations where, like, this person flips a bit, and all of a sudden, what you're doing changes or doesn't make sense. So... I don't ever want to compromise the one player game in order to make the multiplayer game multiplayer game work. But our current design goal is to let people collab play simultaneously in the same game state, collaborating as much as they want, and offer optional situations uh, where collaboration pays off. So an example would be you distract him, you know, this guy kite this guy over there and and I will sneak into the planet while you've done that. And you couldn't have done that in a single player game. And maybe that allows you to get a slightly better result. We don't really want to say that that's the way to win the game or the way to do the best thing. We just want to have payoff to make the players feel good about, oh my God, I just figured something out. If we both go do this at the same time, or if we split in opposite directions, or if you go down to the planet surface, I'll sit in orbit around this planet blasting anyone who comes nearby. So. Those kind of simple ways to let people collaborate feel like the right answer for us. Um, and the, the system Fred's created allows this. How complicated that makes the game logic is going to be interesting. Well, we'll have to see how that goes. <laughs> I hope that answered your question. All right. We'll see in the comments there. Um, now, speaking about kind of like blowing stuff up, exploring for assets, that's another thing that I want to ask both of you about. That with the original Star Control and kind of like that era of games 
Like, that and XCOM was, like, one of the few titles that had, like... I, I kind of use the term, like, multi-system design. Like, this idea that it's not just, you know... You're not just exploring. You're going from plan to plan, one UI in design. You're going to explore the planets on another. You have Super Melee as another system. You have, you know, communication as another. And it kind of felt like, you know, three or four games in one. Like, another example, we made, like, Sid Meier's Pirates, which is another game that I really loved growing up back in the day. But we oftentimes don't see that kind of split focus in games these days. That typically it's going to be one main UI that's going to handle this system, this system, this system. With that said, like, how are you guys, like, thinking about or approaching, you know, again, like, these different gameplay experiences and either, you know, combine them into one cohesive or, you know, having that same kind of split and you do this, 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 and this? You know, um, modality helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that, I mean having different the split game modes because then you don't have to worry about the consequences of, well, you know, for example, first person looking out into space is great if what you're doing is navigating in 3D, but it's really not that fun for seeing cool spaceships with cool weapon effects because everything is big and then it's small as it moves, you know, from you and away. And you just sort of can't get complexity of form in that view. So that's the modern way of doing things. If you go for that way, it's going to have huge consequences in combat. And, and if, if you're, you know, going into orbit and in orbit, you have a chance to like do scans and it's the whole pace is different. And I'm not, I'm not at risk it right now. So I can think about like, what am I going to go down there with them? Where am I going to land? So if you break up all of that modality, you run this risk of carrying some of the emotional setup or the, the tension into a spot where it's not appropriate or having a really hard time providing focus for the person to see the problem or to just be in, be in the right headspace for the experience. So when you're down on the planet surface, that should be like, that's like the landing party has gone down to the planet and you have got to fight the monsters and you know, dodge the horrible things happening on the planet, that you're really not thinking about talking to someone right then. So it's great to focus the interface and focus the experience right around what we want to be achieving. So I think we'll probably have a pretty strict modality still. Um, I think the transitions between it may be less noticeable as we try to just make it feel more organic. But like our game, our game follows Starflight a lot. You know, these are friends of mine and some of the people who worked on Starflight helped us on, on Star Control too. So it's no, no mystery that, and they had some places where they didn't have modality and we added it in. And so you can look at like the experience of coming up to a planet and then zooming in and landing on the planet. It's much more flowy and organic in Starflight as compared to just like hardcore break uh, as it is in, in Star Control. Sorry, hopefully I got my words right. Starflight had to flow into the planet surface and we had the hard break. Um, and I would, if for those interested in game design, you can kind of look at those two ways of solving the same problem and say, what did one achieve and what did the other achieve? Both ways have their own benefits and negatives. So like with Starflight, I never, I, I did feel like I was just going down to that planet surface, but with what we did, it provided this really limited game experience that you knew from the moment you're there. I know what I do. I drive around on this, <laughs> like the way I fly through space, and um, I, can, I can think fast, react fast. It's a limited set of interactions and threats. So it was much more pulse pounding in my mind, that, <laughs> that part, because that's how we wanted. We wanted that to be the intense, fast, scary part. So Modality has its advantages, and you know, I, I may just be old school, but I don't mind that at all. Whether it's in XCOM, which is one of my favorite games, uh, or in Star Control, or in Pirates, which is an, another amazing game. But also, you know, there were, um, I guess, Stardew Valley. We could talk about. It's all sort of the same, looking down from the top. But you know, there's different activities you do. So maybe that's not a good example. Forget I said that. <laughs> 
All right. But they didn't post. Wait, we're live. Sorry. <laughs> and as a quick time check, it is about 6.22 my time, so that would be about 3.22 for both of you. Did you say you had to leave at a 3.40 or 3.50? Just so... 340, there is a U-Haul with my name on it. Okay, so we have about 18 Next minutes. There's all the Skylanders in my garage. They gotta go. <laughs> all right. So, uh, with that said, for people watching us live right now, I'm gonna put in probably last call for any questions for Paul and Fred now, and we will try to wrap things up in, I would say, like maybe like the next 10 to 12 minutes. So, I want to take you right to <laughs> 340 there and all that. So, I guess another point regarding like kind of like the graphics and aesthetics is something that we haven't really touched on yet. I guess one of the other things we've certainly seen from the independent space has definitely been really approaching unique aesthetics with games, whether it's something like a Discord Elysium, Undertale, kind of when you know very yeah. old school, but like very just like completely like off the wall. I don't want to spill anything too much there, but. It's definitely been a very big, I think, artistic expression. That's not just power. Like, just having, you know, the Unreal Engine attached to your game doesn't automatically mean it's going to look great. So, and again, with Star Control 2 being from the 90s, and especially with, like, how aesthetics and stuff have changed, what kind of thoughts have you, have both of you given to the kind of, like, how the game is going to look in terms of, like, you know, for a modern market? Well, in the 30 years since we did the last one, we've made a lot of games, you know, from Sega Genesis all the way up through the most modern console systems. And so we know what you can make things look like, and we know what the consequences are, what the costs are, what the effort that's imposed. Um, but I mean, the simplest thing is, if we made a hyper-realistic science fiction game, it wouldn't look like star control or it wouldn't look like the earth on masters there was a a blending of cartooniness and reality or or real realistic feeling things and so let's take the conversations with aliens screen this is an example we're working on right now so that was all 2d cell art um and so whether it was me doing animations or Greg Johnson, or, or we hired um, a couple of people, one of whom became the director of the Minions movie, anyway, in later in life. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, but now looking at it, you know, so we can do 3D mock-ups and we can look at other games that are doing 3D aliens and just like, hmm, they, they don't quite have the charm uh, that we want. But then we started looking at like 3D, or sorry, animating technologies like Spine which allows you to take layered 2D objects and deform them very much the way that we would rig a skeleton in 3D and weight all the verts and the mesh to it. So you can get the same relationship with the character and with the space from a painting, but now the animation is much more fluid. Um, you know, it's, you know, you don't have to do all of the tweening as bitmaps because it's actually calculating the bending and the deforming of all of the components of your 2D art assets. So that's an example of where, when we have an example of taking a character, doing it at much higher resolution, and still though having it be a painting that we dissect and then animate, uh, I think it's gonna feel much smoother and cooler but at the same time, I think people will recognize it being from exactly the same spot, like the character will feel like the same character, mm -hmm. except hopefully it'll move and behave the way you remembered it. Not at all the way we actually did it, but the way your imagination filled in all the gaps. So that's sort of our, our test. And, you know, then this is, so this is game design nuts and bolts. Um, our ships used to turn on one of 16 facings, no in between, you know, up, side, diagonal, and then one in between. Um, and so when you were being chased or when you were chasing another ship, you would fire your weapons forward. So maybe they're just missing and you would turn and then, oh, gee, maybe they're just missing still. Mm -hmm. That little um, blank zone was mm -hmm. a game element of, of Urquan Masters. You probably flew an Arilu in those little blank spots. 
Well, the very first thing we did was get rid of that, and now we're rotating the bitmap smoothly. And Fred's AI just unloaded on, <laughs> just unloaded everything and hit me with everything. There was no, there was no pause or um, rhythm to like, oh, I'm out of his firing arc, so he's going to turn. Now I'm in the firing arc. It was like, and it was like, uh oh, that's <laughs> trouble. <laughs> That's changed the experience a lot. And, you know, like the Ari Lu could never approach the Urquan now because the Urquan can just turn very gently and nail it. And so we're sort of like, wow, what do we do here? It looks so much better to have the ship turn smoothly. Like that's just a straight up, it's better. But it changed game design. So do you say, okay, we're going to live with this and add some additional limitations to make the ships different? But now they're not, this, the Urquan isn't the way the Urquan used to be. Or do you say, Functionally, there are only 16 directions, but the ship will rotate smoothly between them. And as long as the ship turns fast enough, you'll never exactly see the difference between the ship's facing and the weapons facing. So there's, that's a we haven't solved this one yet, but it's mm -hmm. one that we're dealing with. And it weren't, if it weren't for lasers, I think I would go with the latter option. But with lasers, you really do see <laughs> if they aren't moving smoothly, they look very funky. <laughs> so not sure how we're going to deal with that problem. If you have an answer... Go to the Reddit, UQM2, and let us know. There you go, everyone. There's your challenge for the day for the people watching. <laughs> or if you know of a game that solved the problem. I was also going to add about the characters, though, is or just this the art style of uh, Urquan Masters was pretty pulp science fiction. Mm -hmm. So um, a realistic 3D rendition of spaceships and... Um, just tends to get all brown and gray, and uh, that's not where we want to be in our stylization. So, it, yeah, there's some tough questions to answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even even to that point, I was just discussing this with one of our volunteer artists. So we're planning on doing 2D um, ships, but using something like normal maps and real-time lighting on the, the 2D sprites. So that that gives some great dimensionality and and really pays off a lot without breaking the illusion that it's a, a hand drawn thing. But we were talking about well, if you're in a green star system with a green star, do we want to illuminate everything with that light? And wow, that really puts you in that place. Yeah, I'm at the green star, but all of a sudden the kind of greenish ship and the yellowish ship are looking a lot alike. And it's sort of like hmm, this thing that seemed so cool and so realistic all of a sudden is intruding on the important differentiation between the ships so that's that's a case where you know fred talking about things turning brown and gray that really is the problem sometimes and um we're if you know our games like we're highly saturated that that's sort of i <laughs> <laughs> did i mention yourself, that i like yeah. to drink and make alcohol but no uh, we're highly saturated <laughs> Um, so we want our, our, you know, colors to be very rich and bold and have like pulpy, um, you know, if you go look at like book covers, and magazine covers from the 40s, 50s and early 60s, you'll, you'll know the style we want. And the artist, um, one of the artists who helped define the look, one of them was Errol Otis, uh, famous artists in Dungeons and Dragons and a friend of, of ours. And then another one is George Barr. And he had actually illustrated book covers in the 50, 60s and 50s. And he very much loved that sort of pulp style. And so I loved having him. And we would have him involved. He's, he's gotten old enough that he, his eyesight isn't that great anymore. But we're, we're definitely inspired by the work he's done in the past. And we've collected some of his other paintings to sort of, you know, and we bought them from him so that we could understand better how he approached it. With, you know, a larger selection of artwork, we can kind of start getting a sense of how his take on characters and aliens and ships and environments worked. So we're gonna we're gonna try to recapture as much of that as we can. All right. And I guess I have a, just a few general questions. I, we're about like nine minutes, so I don't think we have time for anything too meaty uh, to end on. But anything regarding Arquan Masters Two, from you know design development, anything that we didn't touch on that either of you would like to mention for people watching? I think in a way, the things that the people would find most interesting is the process of watching something come from almost nothing into full existence. And that's sort of hard to share because it looks so pathetic. No, I mean, it's, it's literally like us sitting around and going, 
What did Fwifo do? Um, <laughs> did he become a movie star? Did he get unstuck in time? Is he the guy who caused all the problems? <laughs> um, did he somehow get involved with the Black Spathy Squadron? Uh, and then so we'll write all these ideas down. And then it's really just us sort of telling stories back and forth to each other until we tell the best story. And that idea of uh, almost playing Dungeons and Dragons with each other. I mean, n not all of us here do this, but but literally almost role playing back and forth what would happen. That all not only works with story, but we do that some in talking mm -hmm. about like ship powers. So I think w what I'd love to to see is if you're interested in game design, come participate in the, the Reddit thread. And we're going to try to bring people along with us on this experience of making a game. Right now, we're in the conceptual and ideation process, and Fred's actually been working very hard for over a year on the development engine. So that typically leads the, the game's development. But I think you're going to see us discuss ideas. You're going to see us make good decisions. You're going to see us make bad decisions, and I hope you see us unmake those. And we want to release very early versions of fragments of the game and get people playing them and giving us feedback. So we're this is the, perhaps one of the most experimental things we're doing is without delegating important creative decision making, we do want to involve as many people who loved Orquan Masters and the original games in the process. Right. And yeah, like, it is, like, very interesting about watching a game's development like that. And, again, we certainly don't have the time to get it. It's like, a, this is another, like, 30, 40 minute long rain I could go into. But it is one of those tough lessons I think a lot of people tend to struggle when it comes to, like, getting into game development. That, and like I said earlier, if all you do is play 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10 Game of the Year winning titles, it's hard to kind of spot that iteration and that evolution that we've seen and like there have been games i played for many developers that have been fantastic and i like speak to them about and they say you know i grew up playing all these games you know it wasn't just this one i played all them and i used that as kind of like my basis for building my design forward and it's again like we can sort of get into like you know philosophy here but I've always said that you can definitely tell when a developer kind of knows what they're, knows that, that understanding of the design process with the game, as opposed to just, like we said earlier, just throwing everything in the kitchen sink in and hoping that, you know, one of these 75 ideas I've come up with, that's one that people will love, but it's buried only the 74 other ideas that everyone hates in this game. Yeah, more is rarely better. That's <laughs> uh, that adding more never helps unless you have everything you've got is working wonderfully and there's a good reason to. Taking yeah. things out is often very helpful. But one reason I'd encourage people to play bad games is one, I made some of them, so please buy them. But <laughs> also, if all you have done is played these amazing games by huge studios that are sequels that have, you know, got geniuses thinking about them for years, your first attempts at making fun is going to look horrible and you're going to feel really bad. <laughs> look yeah. at what people have made that they have sold and realize that, that you don't have to be, on your very first game, the best game on the planet. I mean, that's just an unreasonable expectation. The, the gaming field, people can rationally enter into now it didn't used to be that way the, the you know the audience to be small the developed number of developers was small but now it's the biggest entertainment industry in the world and so look at dissect bad games or take a game that's been cloned like like um save the spire is a good example really you know slave the spire <laughs> yeah save the spire is the less exciting one <laughs> uh, where you know done hooray um but no in slay the spire you know that's brilliant relatively simple and in its initial version and then there's a million different clones of it well go look at what the clones did and see where it falls down and it also tells you what is the heart of the game now one thing about save the spire is that the art is not at all traditional um it's it's very unique and it's it tells you you don't need to have like absolutely high-res cool three-dimensional graphics to make an awesome game design to make an awesome game
Mm -hmm. um, but I do think if you want to be a thoughtful game designer um, and just not shoot from the hip all the time, which is what a lot of designers do, go compare different people's takes on the same idea and say, not which one's better, but where did, the, where did this approach work better? Where did the other approach work better? And sort of accept that there aren't really right answers and wrong answers. There's just tools in a game design. And sometimes a tool is appropriate. Sometimes another tool is slightly better. And the more you can understand the components that go into a game design and how they could be mm -hmm. replaced or how they're affecting each other, I think the more fun and, and success you'll have in designing your own game, which mm -hmm. I hope you all do. Yeah. And I won't respond to that because if I do, we'll be here for another two hours because I could certainly oh. talk about examining design. Well, you know, sometime in less than two years, we can do this again. And particularly if you want to talk about Skylanders. Oh, yeah. Did definitely. I mention that you all full of them? No. no. <laughs> but, yeah, this has definitely been a great chat. So I guess to end on just a few kind of logistics questions I know will probably pop up in the comments. So I, I know there's a question you probably guys have been asked a lot, but any updates in terms of, you know, betas, alphas, you know, when can fans, you know, jump in or start checking this out? Playables are a ways off. Um, many months. Less than a year, many months. And they'll be, they'll be focused game fragments. They won't be the whole game experience initially, mm -hmm. so probably something in Melee is probably the first thing we'll release. Uh, and we'll just probably want to get people seeing how it feels and how it runs across the uh, internet. Uh, but so that they could probably check back in in a few months and they'd be fine. Uh, you can either go to, uh, you know, we are Dogar and Kazon on Twitter. Uh, if you search for that, you'll also find our blog, which usually just now is pointing over to the Reddit thread. And so we read all of the Reddit um, comments. And uh, if you want to participate there or see what other people who are interested in game design are thinking, um, it's a pretty open-minded and pretty non-judgmental, but pretty critical thinking crew. All right. And uh, I'll include links to that in the description in the record version to the Twitter and the uh, Reddit okay. and so on. I just put it in the uh, chat as well for people who wanted there. Um, I guess with that said, my final question then is do you have anything you'd like to say to the fans watching live recorded to end the cast on stay alive until we're finished <laughs> please <laughs> yeah yeah um enjoy life <laughs> and get honey you'll never know when it will be used <laughs> i look like i had vux, vux limpets removed from my head and that is from my pasty white skin meeting the sunlight of my own home world yeah, and I had a situation similar when I went out in the hot October weather two years ago and got, like, horrible sunburn all over my face. <laughs> oh, man. Just wear a spacesuit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it looks cool. It protects you from all kinds of things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Good lesson right. for thank everyone. Thank you very much, Josh, for you, and thanks, everybody out there, for watching. Yeah, thank you. All right. So, uh, with that said, if you guys want my hang on for like twenty seconds after I'm done talking, I'll just have a few things over you posts. But for those of you watching this live or record, we're going to end the interview here. So, thank you again, Paul and Fred, for hanging out. We're getting better. We went from five years to two years. So, hopefully, the next one will be shorter than that. We'll see where the record takes us. Bye, Ken. <laughs> there you go. There's goodbye, the arm of Ken in the back. Arm of Ken. <laughs> So, for those of you watching, again, thank you so much for tuning in. Do all the liking, subscribing, social media stuff that people like to say. If you are a developer working on an upcoming game or just want to talk game design, want to come on for one of these casts, we're always looking for guests. Like I said, you'll find links to everything that Paul and Fred mentioned social media-wise in the description down below. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we are in the science of games. Until next time, everybody. Take care.